Today we're going to look at the Dyson hair dryer repair number three. I also have a video looking into this Dyson mystery box if you wonder what's in this filter because I was getting asked a lot. We're going to be more focused on just the repair itself in this video. So very carefully I plugged this up and I tested for my 120 volts coming all the way up to the power connections on the Dyson because this one was not coming on. I had my 120 volts so as I showed in the disassembly video we unplugged it and took it apart. So you can reference that video in the disassembly if you're interested. And now let's focus on the actual Dyson head unit itself. Let's go ahead and take off the Kapton tape so we can take the front of this off as well. Just give it a good inspection. So there's our NTC thermistor and there's a high voltage ionizer as shown in the previous repair video. This white wire here, this is a high voltage wire, goes to this module that puts out up to 3000 volts to ionize the air coming across the dryer. I want to show here we have our power coming in on our black lead here. Let's go ahead and pull the front part off of the heating element. And we see our thermal fuses here is two in series. It goes through the thermal fuses and back across this bimetallic strip and back to the green wire. We also have our white and our blue wires here. There's like two separate 20 ohm heater element loads here. So if I just bring over my meter in ohms and do a quick check, we knew we had 120 volts coming up to this point. Let's see if it's getting all the way back to the board. If we ohm through the black wire with the switch turned on here, we do have continuity, so the switch is good. And if we go from where the black wire goes on the heating element, it should go through all the thermal fuses in the bimetallic strip and back on the green wire to power the board and nothing. So we do not have it there. I did put together a really quick drawing with some detail of the HD01. And this is just to help with troubleshooting um, if you're doing something similar. And of course, I hadn't gotten to any... Um, board schematics i have done board level troubleshooting in a previous video the number two repair but um i hadn't worked out a lot of stuff about the boards itself yet but if we look at this one especially on a 1500 watt track heater control part we see what our meter leads from the black and going through the switch like so we were good and we had continuity with the switch on so then as we look on down, we're going through two thermal fuses in series and also a bimetallic strip thermal. And when I went across that, I did not have continuity, so I'm losing it there. So we definitely got to focus more on this part here. So after looking at this drawing, let's go back here and maybe it'll be more clear. But we have two thermal fuses right here and let's ohm across this one and... Uh, nope, that is not good. And between the two, just connection wise, yeah, that's low ohms. Let's keep going. This one here is good. This one's good. So that's our bad thermal fuse right there. Hopefully, that's the only problem with this one. The elements look in good shape, no discoloration. So this is the bimetallic strip I was talking about. You can barely see it here, but I'll get a flashlight and shine a little more light. But that's what that is. That is the bimetallic strip. Gotta break the contact if it heats up to a certain limit. So that did not stop the thermal fuses from blowing on this one. But if you look, all the heat and element is in really good shape. Nothing looks overheated or discolored. So it's possible that this got set down maybe on the face of it while it was running. And uh, perhaps it just overheated right at that uh, thermal fuse. But I do know that some of these fail in this manner. So whether it's a flow blocked or, or why it actually blew to start with is hard to say. But we'll replace it and see how it goes. We have our NTC here. And this is where our neutral wire comes in. When I was cutting the heat shrink off, I nicked that insulation. I'll repair that before we go back together. And you may remember in a previous video, this snap ring, I had to take it off to take this cover off to repair the board. Because that repair number two had a board issue. We found a bad diode on the power supply of the board. I'm going to go ahead and mark this one. Because I do have to order the thermal fuse, so it'll be a few days later before I am able to finish this repair. But if we look at this a little closer, 
you can see some discoloration on the top part of the thermal fuse. This one's very bright purple. The other one's got a little more brown shade to it. But these are both 184C. They both were the same color, presumably. All right, so I got some parts in here, including my high temperature connectors. The smaller size comes with some thermal fuses if you buy them as a kit, and they work good for inline splicing, but I'm going to put two together. So I took the next to the smallest size here and cut them in half with the Dremel. So I'm just going to use these little small rings to connect some of the existing leads with the new lead from the thermal fuse. One more time, I don't know if I showed it on video or not, but there's the 184C. And just so you know, I had some 184Cs, and if you look, these are 10 amp rated. These are just some cheaper ones that I had. Um, they'll be fine with smaller loads, and I actually have a purpose for these with, with a situation that it doesn't draw 10 amps, it's fine. But for this load right here, these are either 16 or 20 amp thermal fuses I believe so I do have some 16 amp rated 184C thermal fuses as we see here so I'm actually going to cut this and leave some of the lead like so and probably all the lead on the bottom because it isn't much there and there we go Just bend this out just a little bit so we can get to it to crimp it better. We're just going to bend the leads to make it fit in something. Yeah. I might be a little too much. Yeah, I'm going to straighten this back out just a little. That's going to be pretty close, I believe. Kind of want to lay where the factory had it originally. And there's more than one way to do this, but... The way these are together, it makes it a little more difficult. Some people even solder these on if they're careful. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But the thing about this 184C is it's really close to the melting temperature of leaded solder. So these probably are best to be crimped for sure. I'm just going to put my cut down terminal on here and use the non-insulated crimpers. We'll crimp it down together with the lead that's left, like so. We'll do the same thing here with the top. Get a little bit of the goo and the marker off of this lead. Don't want to cause any corrosion or anything in the future here. We'll slide this on there and... Yep. I think crimping it, something like that would be fine. A non-insulated crimp. And, yep, yeah, that felt pretty good. Get that lead clipping out of there. Going to slide this back into the little mica slot here, like so. That just keeps everything in place and from moving. So that's not the best, but they don't give you a lot of room to work on these. So I think that'll work just fine. And there's more than one way to do this. And if you did have to solder, I guess you could come around the band here and take another lead, uh, especially, say, a 15, 16 amp rated lead like from these thermal fuses here and cut that off itself or leave it long if it'll work and solder it around. You want to keep that pretty flat on the edge of the mica, though, because it's the housing that goes there. But, of course, you know, you don't want the solder to be anywhere close to the heat. 180 to 190C leaded solder will start melting, so, so right in this area here would not be the best. And, of course, if you did solder any thermal fuse, you would have to put some kind of heat sink like this alligator clip. I usually put one on the body and then one on the lead closer to where I'm soldering, by the way. But you can do it. It's just not the best practice to solder them. That's why you see these many times with high temperature crimps on them instead of being soldered from the factory. Because that can definitely degrade the performance of the thermal fuse if you're not careful. I just want to take a second here to share with you a cool project I got to work on for a company that wanted to take a Dyson and run it at a lower temperature and lower flow. And um, 
And thanks to these videos, someone contacted me about working on a project for them. And it was really a cool little project to prototype. So I was able to use a 60 volt supply to, to simply control the heater at a lower PWM. But this is how it works with a 60 volt supply. So you can see the wattage going up here. You know, 50 to 60 volts will run it we pretty go. well. And we can just cut it up as you see the wattage going up here. And this was just built to the customer spec for their needs. And I had to use this little brushless motor that you can find on eBay, by the way. It's, it's not the same as a Dyson, but it is physically the same. I believe it to be more like 40 watts instead of 100 watt. I could not figure out how to run the Dyson motor effectively, and it may not even run below 120 volts. I'm not sure. So what worked out good for us is we needed just a lot less flow anyway. So it worked out great to start with this in about half voltage. And we went from there and the little project worked out great. It was just a fun project. It was a blessing to be a part of it. Just wanted to share that with you. And that's also why this heating element got put back into a different housing than originally it had been taken out of. Because I had bought two broken Dysons. One was my second repair. And it was still working, but I took it apart to go ahead and use it for this project while I was waiting on another broke one. And this is actually it that I'm reassembling with the bad thermal fuse. And just a note here, if you want to mark the mica where your lineup pins are here for your NTC and your ionizer, it'll help going back together like so. It'll only go one way. It's kind of keyed, but it will help you just line it right back up and know where to hold your ionizer. As you slide it back on like so. Just make sure our little bands going around to our thermal fuse are tucked in. Because we did bend those around a little bit. Make sure our NTC is back in there with no stress on the leads. And let me get some Kapton tape. And we're going to put some new tape on it. And just like that going to put it back together now and I'm going to do that in a separate video but I do want to take time to share more about this drawing with you if you're interested in this detail it may help someone working on one very similar to this and it's kind of strange how they laid it out so here's a little bit of help if you want it um, this is the 1500 watt PWM track heater control part that I have drawn out and it shows all the detail we mentioned earlier about the the switch and way it feeds the thermal fuses and goes back to the green, which that actually feeds the board 120 volts to power the board. And we also have the NTC that I measured to be at about 100K at room temperature, just so you know, in case you're having an issue with yours and have any questions about that. The 100 watt motor, I believe, is a switch reluctance motor. It's rated at 100,000 RPM and 100 watts. It's just got you two leads, so that's got me a little bit confused on how to run that motor. It, I did try it enough to, to basically burn up one. It, I was trying to switch it at high speeds, and it was um, it's a little more to it than that. I actually did burn up one motor, and that's when I, I decided to call it quits and, uh, and go with the Chinese version for, for what I'd done. So for the little project, that is. But we also had the ionizer up here. 120 volts in up to 3000 volts DC out for ionizing the air through the dryer. As mentioned, the inline block here in the GFCI, we did a video on that because we did get a lot of questions. People thought it was a power supply and things of that nature. And obviously, a 1800 watt power supply will be huge and it's not that big. So we knew it was some type of filtering. We're surprised by the caps that were in it. Um, if you're interested in that, check out that video. And if you have any issues reassembling your hair dryer, check out the video after this one where I'm showing here that I'm starting to get this ready to go back together. And since I have many repair videos now, I don't want all the videos to all have like partial disassembly and partial reassembly. And it makes the video twice as long. So I'll do those separate and we'll always have those for reference. And moving forward, it'll just be the repair part. If it's anything I find different with one. And this is just a test after reassembly if you're interested. And, and it did work perfectly fine. 
at this time is still doing so. Well, I hope you found this video helpful today. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. I'll have more videos coming out in the upcoming week or so about the disassembly and the reassembly of it as well. I'll have some links down in the video description of some tools and interesting items that I find very helpful on my workbench. And any of those links that you click on are affiliate links and to help support the channel. And I greatly appreciate it. So thanks so much for watching and God bless.